Okay, well, it is 11.05. Let's, let's get the show on the road. Um, we're very excited about this today. Um, we've never had anybody present um, uh, genetics for the genealogist, and we are really happy that Dr. Michelle Belboisier has joined us to do it. Um, let me uh, give you a slight introduction to what we'll be discussing today. Uh, this is from the program description, but we will be hearing from uh, Dr. Boise, Boise um, to uh, discuss basic genetics concepts, which should provide you as genealogists with a better understanding of consumer genetic testing, you know, like 23andMe, Ancestry.com, or Ancestry DNA, and very many others. Um, hopefully to relate that to your explorations of your own family history through uh, traditional genealogy. Uh, she'll be providing an overview of her family history with a look at the questions answered and raised by doing the genetic analysis. And she'll also be giving a scientific explanation of how the genes work, which is somewhat important to understand, but she'll be going in depth on that. Um, I also want to thank Heather Veneziano from the uh, New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries at the Archdiocese of New Orleans for joining us. She was uh, fabulous and she was able to organize this with Dr. Boissier for us. We're really excited and we're really excited that all of you have joined us this morning um, to uh, learn. Um, I will uh, say one more time that uh, we are going, we are recording this and it will be available on our YouTube channel um, in, in about a week. So you can share this with anybody that you want to. Um, it's okay if they couldn't attend today. The way that we'll structure this is we will have uh, Dr. Boistier give her presentation and then we will have a chat question and answer session at the end. I'll let you all know when that begins. At that time, you all should be able to type questions in chat and I will present them to um, everybody uh, in the order that I receive them. I'll speak them and then I will give everybody a chance to answer. Um, so uh, with that being said, oh, and, and just in case, I can't remember if I did it. I'm Amanda Fallis. I'm an archivist at the City Archives, which we love putting on these kind of presentations for y'all. But with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Heather Veneziano for a little more housekeeping. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to make some announcements at the end as well, but throughout the course of the presentation, because we are recording, we just ask that you keep your cameras and audio off. Um, and then if you have any very specific questions that maybe the whole group wouldn't maybe be interested in, you could, we'll give some contact information and you could send those via email. But um, general questions, please do send them in. We're really happy to help you with those. And then if you have questions about using the research presented by Dr. Bossier um, in conjunction with the archives, either at the city or with the archdiocese, uh, Amanda and I are also happy to answer some of those afterwards. But welcome. I'm going to turn this over now um, to Dr. Bossier and maybe you want to give a brief introduction about yourself and your work prior to the presentation that would be fantastic thank you so much for joining us thank you heather thank you amanda for inviting me today um as i said i am michelle bell boissier and this morning i'm going to talk to you about the genetics that is necessary in order to understand some personal um, ancestry dna testing so um, I thought I should start with some introductory questions that you might have. Who am I? Um, what's my connection to our sponsors and what we're going to talk about today? Well, each of us probably has many ways that we can describe or define or identify ourselves. One of the most important ways that I identify or describe myself is that I am a multi, emphasis on multi, generational Louisiana Black Creole. And there is a whole lot of nuance and a whole lot of extra depth that goes along with that particular description of who I am, some of which will come through in today's presentation. I am also for, this is the beginning of my 28th year now, on the faculty at Xavier University of Louisiana. 
and I teach in the biology department. I'm head of the biology department. And the course that I teach most often, in fact, every single semester is genetics lecture. And I also have a special class for seniors that is specifically human genetics, where we analyze primarily the use of genetics in um, the medical field, but we also do a little bit of a detour into genetics for ancestry analysis. So that's who I am. What is my connection to our sponsors? Well, um, first and foremost, like most Louisiana Black Creoles, I am a cradle Catholic. And in addition to the fact that I am a Catholic, my family has a tomb at St. Louis Number Two Cemetery. My brother is in the process of restoring that tomb to the glory that it should have. And in his process of restoring that tomb, he had some meetings with Heather, one of which I joined. Heather and I started talking and realized that there might be um, a way for me to do this presentation. And she brought in Amanda from the library to basically serve as the host of this. Um, you know, I have no other connection to the library except when I started thinking about what's my connection to the library. Truth is there were many, many afternoons in my summers as a uh, teenager that I walked to the Norman Mayer branch of the New Orleans Public Library to have something productive to do with my time. And although I am a scientist, I never gravitated toward science books. I always gravitated toward history books. And in between my classes, when I was a student at Xavier University, I would spend time that I probably should have spent studying for biochemistry, um, but I would usually spend time in the stacks um, wandering through books, often books that um, had some focus on history and on Louisiana history. So what are we going to discuss today? My goal is to assist people who don't have much of a background in biology or in genetics, but who are interested in doing these ancestry genetics tests. It's much easier to understand them and to realize what about them is meaningful and what is not as meaningful if you have a little bit of a background in genetics. So my goal is to improve the genetics knowledge base of people who are using genetics as part of their ancestry um, evaluations. So I promise that although I'm going to give you a lot of genetics information this morning before I start to talk about my own um, family history and my own family's genetic analysis, I will not give you a final exam at the end of this lecture or at the end of the course. That would be incredibly unfair, um, but I hope you bear with me and, and appreciate the um, extra depth of knowledge about biology and particularly about genetics that I share as I begin this presentation. So to start with a very basic definition, genetics is the scientific study of how physical characteristics in living organisms are inherited from their parents and how those physical characteristics are actually expressed or manifested in the organism who contains that genetic material. There are two major branches of genetics. So the traditional, or as we call it, transmission genetics, truly traces the frequency of specific physical characteristics from generation to generation. So, I'm sure most of you took a biology course in high school, and some of you may have taken a biology course in college. And if you did, you probably remember doing Gregor Mendel's Punnett squares on the green pea plant. That is the beginning of and the heart of classical genetics, where you're looking at a physical characteristic in some living organism and seeing when the parents have different um, expressions of that characteristic, what are the chances that a, a, an offspring will have one version versus the other version. Another standard component of classical genetics and a component that is used in practice on a regular basis is the construction of pedigrees. So a pedigree is basically a chart that traces the inheritance or the appearance 
of one particular characteristic from one generation to the next. If any of you have ever had cause to visit a genetics counselor, typically what genetics counselors help people do is to look at the frequency of a rare um, genetically based disease within a family to help them to predict whether or not that disease will occur again in the next generation. Today, in contemporary genetics, in addition to doing some of those what's going on from one generation to the next analyses, there's also a very precise analysis of the individual molecules that are responsible for producing those physical traits. And of course, when we talk about the molecules that are responsible for producing traits, we're talking about deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. So I'm sure all of you attending this um, know everything there is to know about what is genealogy, certainly more than, than I know about genealogy, perhaps. Um, genealogy is the study of family history. And traditionally in genealogy, when a family analysis, a family lineage is, is done, it's really an historical um, analysis. So historical records from churches, from governments, et cetera, et cetera, from acts of sale, businesses, et cetera, et cetera, oral interviews are done to put together a story about a family's history. In genealogy, extended family relationships over multiple generations come to light. And I like to think of genealogy as helping a person see a clearer view of their place and their family's place in history. Well, one of the standard components of genealogy is the construction of family tree charts right, to present sort of a comprehensive overview of the findings of, of reading all of those historical documents and gathering all that information through interviews. Today, contemporary genealogy, like contemporary genetics, includes an analysis of the DNA in the people who are doing this genealogy um, investigation. And that genetic analysis can complement the historical records and identify more details, more nuances about shared ancestry. Well, when we talk about genetics and genealogy together, it is in many ways a merger of one aspect of history and one aspect of biology. Most of biology and most of all of the scientific disciplines give very little thought to the past. Very little attention is paid to history. But genetics has always included some analysis of what is the history. Even in the basic Mendelian green pea crosses, you were looking at what would happen for a physical characteristic from one generation to the next generation. So one huge part of genetics has always been to follow characteristics from generation to generation. So that means looking at something along a timeline connecting generations. In addition to that, to anyone who knows even a little bit about genetics and a little bit about genealogy, it's easy to realize that the family tree that is constructed in a genealogy analysis is exactly the same thing as the pedigree chart that I teach my students in my genetics class. So if you look at this family tree where we see an individual up at the top and their parents and then their grandparents and so on and so on for several generations, here in this family tree, we see the names of the individuals and we see the year that they were born and the year that they died. That's the standard information in a family tree chart. If we take this exact same family tree chart and instead of putting the person's name and years that they lived, you put their genotype, the 
expression of a physical characteristic characteristic that they have, this is a pedigree that you would use in a genetics analysis. So the family tree, the pedigree, those are truly the same thing. The only difference is with the family tree, you're looking at the individual as a whole. And with the pedigree, you are looking at one particular physical characteristic, but tracing it for the same kind in the same kind of ways from generation to generation. So even before there was use of molecular genetics and DNA analysis in genealogy, there was already a considerable um, and comfortable relationship between classical genetics and classical genealogy analysis. So as you recall, contemporary genetics does a precise analysis of the DNA of the molecule that is responsible for producing physical characteristics, that same molecule that is what is passed from parent to offspring to the next generation and so on and so on. Well, analysis of DNA molecules has opened a new door for genealogy. Patterns within the DNA molecules are shared by relatives. And those patterns can give considerable insight into ancestral lineage. So if you are doing or have done genealogy and you've incorporated a genetic test or you're interested in incorporating a genetic test that study, how much genetics do you need to understand to use that ancestry information? Well, first of all, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, which I'm sure you've all heard of before, DNA is a molecule that is present in every living organism, every microorganism like bacteria, every plant cell, every animal cell, and of course, in the human animal as well. What's DNA's job? DNA is used to direct all of the tasks and functions that an organism needs to perform in order to stay alive. DNA decides which molecules a cell can produce. Those molecules are things like the pigment for your hair, the pigment for your eyes, the amount of insulin that you produce, the way your immune system functions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. DNA is also the molecule that is passed from cell to cell during mitosis to produce new cells that is passed from parent to offspring in reproduction. The DNA in our cells looks something like this. The DNA, the DNA in our cells winds and coils upon itself to form these compacted structures that we all know as chromosomes. And those chromosomes, if any of you have taken any biology classes or if you have chosen to remember any biology, um, those chromosomes are arranged within the nucleus of our cells. So as humans, the standard total number of chromosomes per cell is 46 chromosomes per cell. So that would be the number of chromosomes that are present in every one of the cells in all of our bodies. Among those chromosomes, 44 of the 46 are what we call autosomes. And two of those 46 are what we call sex determination chromosomes. Among those 44, so to give just a little extra information about the autosomes and the sex determination chromosomes, it's not 44 completely different autosomes. It's 44 autosomes because there are 22 different kinds of autosomes and each of us possesses in each of our cells two copies of each of those types of autosomes. So the 22 different types of autosomes with two copies each, that's how we get to the 44 autosomes, okay? And when I describe a type of 
autosome or a type of chromosome. If you have, as you do, two chromosomes of type number one, that means both of those chromosomes that we consider the same type are the same size as each other. They have the same relative shape as each other. And most importantly, they contain genes for the same physical characteristics. So if you have a gene on chromosome number one that determines your production of a certain immune molecule, you'll have a gene on your other chromosome number one that also at the same position on the chromosome affects the same physical characteristic. The reason you have two of each of those types of autosomes is because you have two parents and you got one of each type from each parent. If we turn our attention now to the two sex determination chromosomes that we all possess, there are two different kinds of sex determination chromosomes. One is called the X chromosome and the other is called the Y chromosome. Females have two sex determination chromosomes and both of the sex determination chromosomes in females are X chromosomes. Males also have two sex determination chromosomes, but in males, one of those sex determination chromosomes is the X, and the other sex determination chromosome in males is the Y. So they also form a pair, but they're not a matching pair. So our autosomes are matching pairs. We call that homologous pairs. And in females, the X chromosomes form a homologous or matching pair. But in males, the pair of sex determination chromosomes is mismatched. It is not homologous. So this is simply um, two images of fluorescently stained human chromosomes. So this is not a sketch or a painting of chromosomes. These are actual photographs taken through a microscope of chromosomes to which fluorescent dyes have been added. So you'll see here on your left is a pair of human chromosome number one, a pair of human chromosome number two, et cetera, et cetera. And if we go all the way down to the last pair, this is the pair of X chromosomes. So that tells us by looking at the chromosomes in this cell, that this is a female because there are two X chromosomes, there is no Y chromosome. In this image, we see a human male chromosome spread um, and we see comparable pairs of autosomes, but then for that pair of sex determination chromosomes, one of those is an X and the other is a Y. Um, obviously, um, these are done not only from two different individuals, these were done actually at two different laboratories. So the set of fluorescent dyes that was used in the two different um, photomicrographs is different from each other. But you see the pattern of having pairs of homologous or matching um, autosomes and then the mismatched pair of sex determination chromosomes that is present in males. So in order to study multiple generations, you are studying the products of many instances of reproduction. So to take just a quick look at that process of reproduction from a chromosomal standpoint in humans, if humans have 46 chromosomes in each cell, your grandparents, your great-great-grandparents, your children, your great-grandchildren have 46 chromosomes per cell. But of course, we receive the 46 chromosomes that we have by getting 23 chromosomes from our mother and 23 chromosomes from our father. So the ova that are produced by women, also commonly called eggs, contain 23 chromosomes. 
among those 23 chromosomes in an egg, 22 are autosomes, one of each autosomal type, and one is a sex chromosome. Of course, both of the X chromosomes, both of the sex chromosomes in a female are indeed X chromosomes. So that means all of the eggs, all of the ova a female produces will indeed include an X chromosome. Then when we refer to sperm production, sperm will also contain 23 chromosomes total. They will include 22 autosomes and one sex determination chromosome. Since males have X and Y sex determination chromosomes, that means half of the sperm produced by males contain an X chromosome and half of the sperm produced by males will contain a Y sex chromosome. So the males, when they give a sperm that has an X chromosome, the offspring will be a female. And when males give a, a sperm that contains a Y chromosome, the offspring will be a male. So you are familiar with, I'm sure, the company 23andMe. What's the deal with the number 23? Why is it so important? Well, if you're talking about connecting generations, 23 is the number of chromosomes you received from each of your parents. And again, connecting generations, 23 is the number of chromosomes you will donate to each of your children. By giving offspring half of your chromosomes, what you're ensuring is generational continuity in chromosome number. So no matter how many generations you are fortunate enough to analyze, you know that the number of chromosomes in each generation is the same. And so we can we keep our genetic description of what it means genetically to be a human being, 46 chromosomes, we keep that consistent. And this is just an image showing that in the female parent, there would be 46 chromosomes total existing in 23 pairs. And when she produces an ovum or an egg, that ovum or egg includes 23 chromosomes. And then when we look at the male parent, he too includes 46 chromosomes in each of his cells. But during the process of sperm production, he makes the sperm to have 23 chromosomes. So the 23 from the mother, the 23 from the father fuse. In blue here, we see the um, ovum that has a sperm penetrating it. And that's how you get the embryo, which of course has now 46 chromosomes. Well, when we talk about that process of producing the 23 chromosomes in an egg or the 23 chromosomes that are in a sperm, there is a, a series of events that occurs when the reproductive cells that are being produced that absolutely ensures that every generation has an additional layer of diversity in physical characteristics, okay? So this process is really, really a creative process, if you will, because it makes sure that the chromosomes you pass to future generations, you're not passing to them identically as you received them, but you're passing to them by taking a little piece of what you received from your mother and a little piece of what you received from your father and mixing those together to donate a chromosome to your offspring. So before donating chromosomes to offspring, before producing an ovum in a female, before producing a sperm in a male, those pairs of homologous chromosomes in the parents actually swap pieces with each other. 
that process of genetic recombination is called crossing over. So we see here a pair of chromosomes that might be present in one individual. So let's say this is a pair of my chromosome number one. This is my chromosome number one that I got from my mother. This is my chromosome number one that I got from my father. I did not give my son either this, either, either part of this or either part of this intact as they existed. Instead, they combined with each other to make new gene combinations. The new gene combinations place my mother's version of this gene now on the same chromosome with my father's version of these genes. That is crossing over. That is what is done to really ensure the physical diversity from generation to generation. So again, as I said, everything that I passed to my child, I passed to him, not as whole entities the way they exist in me, but in new combinations that don't actually exist in me on the same individual chromosome. Within my chromosome pairs, yes, but not on any one individual chromosome. And the image you see here is indeed of my son and my mother and my father. That picture was taken, I believe in 2006. So later on in the presentation, you might get a glimpse of what my son looks like today. Um, okay. So <clears throat> again, just to recap, the chromosomes in our cells are composed of the molecule DNA. DNA is a very, very complex molecule. The DNA that we possess is composed of billions with a B subunits, repeating subunits, that are called nucleotides. Those nucleotides are linked to each other to form an incredibly long chain of nucleotides that's a whole DNA molecule. There are four types of nucleotides. A, T, G, and C, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. So all of us, and indeed every living organism, so all of the other animals, all of the plants, all of the fungi, all of the bacteria, all of the viruses have only four different nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. With only four different kinds of nucleotides existing in all living organisms, how can we have the kind of diversity among life forms that we do? Well, because there are billions of those nucleotides, it is a specific order of our nucleotides that gives us our molecular identity. Okay? So the specific order of my billion plus nucleotides is unique to me. And the specific order of your billion plus nucleotides is also unique to you. There are functional little subunits within our DNA that we call genes. So a very basic working definition of a gene is that a gene is a segment of nucleotides, a little subset of one chromosome or one DNA molecule, that the specific order of nucleotides within that subset tells that organism, gives direction to that organism, to that cell, on how to produce a specific molecule. So one gene directs the production of one particular molecule, and of course that molecule that it makes, which is usually a protein, that molecule will either be an enzyme that we need for our cells to function or a structural molecule for our bodies to grow. If you look at the entire set of genes, nucleotides, DNA, that is present in one entire organism, that is the organism's genome. I trust that you've all heard the word genome before, um, about 
15, a little over 15 years ago, a lot of attention was paid to the word genome and this idea of the human genome project. So in the 1990s, a new technique for DNA analysis was developed. Um, DNA analysis had been possible since the 1970s, but it was extremely expensive, extremely difficult, not all that accurate, and really, really long, um, very, very, very long time to occur. But in the 1990s, a new technique for DNA analysis was developed and fine-tuned that made analyzing the nucleotide by nucleotide sequence of a gene quicker, easier, more accurate, and relevant here, less expensive. So using that new technique, which is basically um, something called polymerase chain reaction or PCR, using that new technique, it was quickly understood that it was going to be possible to sequence the entire genomes of living organisms. And a coordinated effort was made by the top groups of scientists in the world to basically each take on the role of sequencing the, a subset of the human genome so that hopefully their target, um, when they began the project around 1989 or so, um, the target was, can we sequence the entire human genome in less than 15 years, okay? Well, they completed not only on time, they completed two years early. So in 2003, the entire human genome was sequenced and that was considered the completion of the human genome project. So the data that was um, put forth as a result of the human genome project was what you could consider a standard sequence or a reference point, a reference sequence for what a human genome contains. Now, perhaps this will raise the question, how can you have a standard genome sequence? Because aren't we all unique? We are. However, um, while it is true that within our billions of nucleotides, each of us has our own unique order of A's, T's, G's, and C's, the majority, I mean, overwhelming majority, 98%-ish, we think, um, of our nucleotides is incredibly similar to everyone else's nucleotide sequences. So it is possible to have sort of a reference sequence, right? And it is important for us, especially in the context of this talk, which, you know, is going to um, lead us toward genealogy. Yes, only a small percentage of the DNA that any one of us has is truly unique. However, it's that same small percentage that is unique, that's the percentage that we are most likely using to produce our physical characteristics, okay? So it is the unique sequences within our DNA that we're actually using to express and live as we are. So the ancestral DNA testing that is available through multiple companies does not analyze every single nucleotide that you possess. That would take longer, but more importantly, that would be much more expensive. Um, 10 years ago to analyze an entire human genome would probably cost about two or three thousand dollars. Today, to analyze an entire human genome would cost about somewhere between $700 and $1,000. The ancestry test that most of us use costs about $100 up to $200. So they are not analyzing every single nucleotide that you have when you engage one of these testing services. So what are they looking for? they are looking for the most unique nucleotides among your complete set of nucleotides. Specifically, what they're looking for is your collection of SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. 
In other words, individual nucleotides that are present in a position in you that most people don't have that nucleotide at that place. So for example, if most people have a thymine nucleotide at this position of this gene, but you have a cytosine nucleotide at that position of that gene, that is a single nucleotide polymorphism or uniqueness in you. Well, since we inherit our DNA from our ancestors, that means we're also inheriting our SNPs from our ancestors. And the more SNPs you have in common with someone, the more closely related you are to them, okay? Just a quick aside, um, while we all find um, using genetics to complement genealogy interesting, there are, of course, many other wonderful things that have come about from the advances in genetic technology. Um, some things that give people a little bit of fear and some things that give people a little bit of comfort. So one of the things that gives some people some fear um, is the use of genetic analysis and genetic genealogy for forensic purposes. So as you probably know, if you watch um, Law & Order SVU like I do, um, you probably know that you can use a genetic analysis to find relatives of someone um, who were present for and therefore perhaps a suspect at a crime scene. Um, so genetic genealogy also has a role to play, not just in ancestry testing um, or ancestry analysis, but it also has a role to play in, um, in the law and in crime solving. So I know that gives some people a little bit of fear, um, not the topic of this conversation, so I'll leave it at that. Um, but genetics and molecular genetics as we can use it today has grown and developed so much even within the last decade that we now have genetic medicine or personalized medicine. Um, in other words, 25 years ago, if five people were diagnosed with the same cancer, cancer in the same organ um, on the same day, they would receive pretty much the same course of treatment. That is not the case today. Today, the cells of your cancer are analyzed for their genetic profile to look for the specific mutations that are associated with that led to your cancer. And your treatment plan is developed in response to knowing the actual genes that are involved in your cancer. So there are many, many things that have come through the advances in genetic technology. So um, the history and biology that come together in genetic genealogy, of course, also includes some geography. Um, because when you're doing this ancestral DNA testing, you're looking at collections of SNPs and correlating them, or the company is correlating your collection of SNPs to just how common those SNPs are in different places around the world, okay? So if your DNA has multiple SNPs that are really common in Asia, but really rare in all other, on all other continents, then that's telling you through your SNPs, through your genes, that you must have Asian ancestors. Um, a couple more kind of genetics definitions before I really get into the more ancestry uh, part of this. In many of your um, genetic testing results, you might see the word haplotype. Um, a simple definition of haplotype is it's a collection of SNPs that are inherited together without being switched around, right? It's hard to get haplotypes staying together. It's hard to get SNPs staying together for multiple generations when you're talking about SNPs on the autosomes, because remember the autosomes keep switching pieces with each other and crossing over. But it is easy to get collections of SNPs that are not switched up and distorted when we're looking at the Y chromosome. Because remember, males have one Y chromosome, not two, and females don't have Y chromosomes. Since there's only one Y chromosome, 
why chromosomes don't engage in very much crossing over because they don't have a homologous partner to exchange pieces with. So the collection of SNPs that are present on a Y chromosome are not changed very much and they are passed directly without a lot of revision from father to son to grandson to great grandson, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So you can look at the Y chromosome haplotype, the collection of Y chromosome single nucleotide uniqueness from male to male to male to male. And that's a very useful piece of information for ancestral lineage. Also, there is a mitochondria haplotype. A mitochondria is a small cellular compartment. It's not a part of the nucleus, but it does have its own little piece of DNA. So it's like an extra piece of DNA on top of what you have in your chromosomes. Well, at fertilization, the egg gives all of its mitochondria to the new embryo, all of them. Mothers are so generous, aren't we? Um, the sperm, on the other hand, usually gives no mitochondria to the offspring. So if you analyze just the DNA that is in a mitochondria, the DNA that's in your mitochondria are the DNA that were in your mother's mitochondria and her mother's mitochondria and so on and so on and so on. And this just it isn't just true for females. This is for all people. We can trace ancestral lineages by looking at mitochondrial DNA composition or mitochondrial haplotypes. All right, so just a couple of words about the different testing companies that you all may be considering or may have used. The truth is all of the big companies, all of the big companies use about a million SNPs. So you have billions of nucleotides. All of the companies are using about a million SNPs to prepare their analysis for you. And while every company tells you they're better than the other one, they're actually all using the same SNPs. Um, there is very, very little, there's one exception to that, um, but there's very little variation in which SNPs are being analyzed by the different companies. So I don't get paid by any of those companies. Um, so I can't do an ad, an ad for either one of those companies, right? And the truth is they're all using about the same number of SNPs and mostly the same SNPs, okay? And so if you wonder if they're using the same number of SNPs and the same actual SNPs, same little spots in your genes, how is there different um, results? How are there different results produced if you use two companies for DNA analysis, which sometimes happens? Well, the difference in the reports that the companies give is because each company has its own team of bioinformatics specialists um, who are doing these really sophisticated mathematical formulas, these algorithms, to analyze the total collections of SNPs that they have and to then make predictions about where your ancestors lived. So the raw data in terms of which nucleotides that is collected from all of the different companies is pretty much the same, but the report that they give you can be different because they have their own way of interpreting that data, their own algorithms for making predictions about where your genes were 500 years ago, et cetera, okay? Um, two important facts. None of the mathematical formulas are really accurate beyond, say, the third cousin prediction. So when you get the emails from the testing company saying we have new relatives and it predicts it's a third cousin, fourth cousin, or third cousin twice removed, fourth cousin, et cetera, et cetera, take those things with a great big grain of salt. So if the testing company tells you you have a half sibling, you know, I don't know if that's good or bad news to you, but that's probably true. 
if the testing company reveals to you a first cousin that you didn't know you had. That's probably true as well. But once you get to that second cousin, third cousin mark, the accuracy is really limited. Um, you know, if you share 1% of DNA with someone, they might be obviously related to you or that might be an accident, okay? A coincidence, if you will. Um, another important fact is that you cannot have 100% confidence about the predicted proportion of ancestry within a continent. So what do I mean by that? I'm gonna pull up a map to discuss that, okay? So if you get an ancestry report and it tells you you have X percentage from Spain, X percentage from France, X percentage from Italy, you know, if you really want to, you could walk from New Orleans to Mississippi. And if you really wanted to, therefore, before um, the Wright brothers um, had built any airplanes to allow ease of travel from place to place, you could walk from France to Italy. So percentages between those two places or between any two places that share a border, take that with a grain of salt, okay? However, if it tells you a certain percentage Asia and a certain percentage Africa and a certain percentage North America, these days it's easy to go from here to here to here, but a hundred years ago and 200 years ago, and a thousand years ago, that was not an easy journey. So the numbers that are presented to you from continent to continent are pretty accurate, but the numbers that are presented to you with subtle differences are much less accurate. Okay, so, um, if you're going to do this ancestry analysis as a family, um, I do recommend that you use the same testing service among the members of a family because it's much easier to compare your results with each other if you use the same company. Um, there was a tiny window of time a couple of years ago that all the companies allowed you to download the raw data and transfer it over to the other company so that you could do that. Um, that analysis cross company, but that was truly like a one month window of time. If you didn't do it then, you'd actually have to pay them an additional fee um, to do the cross company analyses today. Um, I also encourage you to remember that these companies are big business. They are money-making ventures. And so like all other businesses, you know, they kind of exaggerate their accuracy. They kind of exaggerate the significance of their findings. They kind of exaggerate how much better they are than all the other companies. So just keep that in mind. This is a business, right? That, you know, it's not a service. Um, some of the big companies include Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage DNA, obviously Ancestry DNA and 23andMe. Ancestry DNA and 23andMe are the largest companies by far. And the advantage to using one of the larger companies, again, I get no commission from either of these companies. I have no association with either of these companies, but the bigger companies have a bigger database. And in all of science, the bigger the data pool that you have, the more accurate the interpretation of data becomes. So, you know, I, I would, unless you, you know, get, if you get a free kit from one of the other companies, by all means use it. But the bigger the database, the more accurate it's going to be. Okay. Um, another little aside, as many of you probably know, 23andMe actually does have more SNPs than any of the other companies. Um, 23andMe was founded by a scientist. And um, in addition to the ancestry SNPs, they analyze SNPs related to physical phenotypes, physical characteristics, and also to some um, genetic disorders and genetic conditions. So 23andMe does have more SNPs than the other companies. All right, 
So I started this with introductory questions about who am I, what's my connection to the sponsors, what are we going to discuss today? And I think I've done probably more than you wanted about a background in genetics that might help you to understand your ancestry um, test results. Um, I told you that as much of a story as you probably need about how I came to be here today, my connection to the library and to um, the archdiocese and the cemeteries. And obviously from the last 30 minutes, you can tell, yeah, I probably teach genetics all the time and think that's a fun thing to do. Um, but what I haven't talked about is my own personal family story, that very, very important thing to me, um, the fact that I am a multi-generational Louisiana Black Creole. So for the next couple of minutes, I won't bore you too long. You probably have no interest in my own personal background, but to tell you the story and add a couple of snippets of my own um, ancestry testing. Um, you know, this idea of Louisiana Black Creole, obviously that's a new world phenomenon, a new world phrase, right? Um, the new world is the Americas, those things that were discovered, um, but those places that were discovered by the colonizers from Europe. Well, the Creole culture and the Creole genetic admixture is absolutely the result of a very long, very complex marinade of ingredients. Um, if, any, if, if ever anything was a gumbo, the combination of genes that people like myself and others from South Louisiana have, that is quite a, I think, delicious, tasty marinade. Um, because you have the mixture of culture and genes from the Europeans who were the colonizers, obviously from the indigenous, uh, indigenous Americans that they found here in the New World, and from Africa and any other place around the world that they colonized. So the genes, the customs, the foods, the musical instruments, the religious practices, all of those things have come together to form that Creole genetic admixture, to form that Creole culture as many of us in this Zoom know it. Um, the genetic patterns that you see in one of these ancestry tests absolutely reflect the historical patterns. So the mitochondrial haplotypes and the Y chromosome haplotypes in the Americas tell the exact same story that history books tell about colonization, but they tell that story on a molecular level. So who was the typical immigrant to the Eastern seaboard of North America? The, the colonists, right? They were migrating primarily because of religious persecution. And typically when people leave their home and go to a way far away place because of religious persecution, they're doing that as families. So liaisons between colonizers and slave, uh, enslaved people and indigenous people were forbidden and hidden. But the immigrants to Louisiana, to South America, to the Caribbean, many times they weren't leaving because of religious persecution. They were businessmen traveling for a professional work opportunity. Businessmen traveling for work opportunities usually leave their wives and families at home. So there were more and more open, less hidden liaisons between colonizers, enslaved people, and indigenous people. And in some time periods, those relationships were even legal. So family units formed and that new um, layer of society form formed that is obviously still in existence um, in some ways today in Louisiana. The genetic admixture in Creole country is rich. Um, 23andMe has reported that the percentage of Caucasians who discover that they have some small amounts, usually a small amount of black or African ancestry is higher in Louisiana than it is in any other state in the United States of America. I don't think that should surprise anybody who is even partially aware of history. 23andMe also reports that Louisiana basically stops dead in its track. The percentage of African heritage that 
otherwise in the South, in slaveholding states, gradually increases from state to state to state in all the places that still had slavery at the time of the Civil War until you get to Louisiana. So if you look at the US map, um, at the time of the Civil War, these states already had ended slavery, right? All up here had ended slavery. Um, but all of this was still slaveholding territory. And if you look at the percentage of non-African genes in Black people from all of these states, the percentage of um, non-African genes, so the percentage of Caucasian ancestry among Black people from, say, Virginia on down, it gets higher and higher, more and more African, African, more and more African percentage, less Caucasian percentage, consistently until you hit Louisiana when it flip-flops, okay? And that is all because of the, the, the kind of different attitude that French and Spanish colonizers had toward indigenous liaisons and the liaisons with enslaved peoples. Um, so the Y chromosome haplotypes are very often, even in men who are African American, um, both in the US and in the Caribbean and in South America, those are often the Y chromosome haplotypes that are European, especially um, with France and the Iberian Peninsula. So the Iberian Peninsula, of course, is Spain and Portugal. By contrast, the mitochondrial haplotypes are overwhelmingly African. So that means what history tells us about so many children being produced from a slave owner and an enslaved woman, well, that's what the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA tell us as well. So not only the history tells us that story, on a molecular level, that's what the genes say as well. And again, that genetic analysis validating the historical data, you see the same patterns in all of the new world in North America, in South America, and throughout the Caribbean. Um, you know, some people say, do you really need ancestry in order, um, ancestry DNA testing in order to do an ancestry report? Well, I think it adds an element to the analysis. Um, that's, you know, my personal opinion is that, yeah, you do, but adds an element to the, to the analysis. And especially from a personal standpoint, as a black woman, um, African Americans are more likely to encounter all kinds of huge gaps in data. In the US Constitution, Blacks are considered three fifths of a person. And so if you're not a complete person, you're less worthy of historical documentation. So for extended periods of time, African Americans were not allowed to own property, so there are no property records, which is a valuable historical record. Um, prevented from having legal marriages another valuable historical record, right? And for a long time, zero control of maintaining family units. During slavery, family units could easily be broken up where one person would be sold to um, another plantation. So for those reasons, there are more gaps in the data for African-Americans. And so having the extra information of the genetic analysis you know, it, it certainly can't help to round out and complete the story that you are attempting to um, unfold, okay? Um, you know, and the truth is, you know, again, talking from my own perspective as being this multi-generational, you know, Louisiana Black Creole, there are many times that um, Creoles had physical um, characteristics that enabled them to pass for white. And so they would sever their ties with the rest of their family um, in most of these cases. So that even adds another type of gap in the ancestry story, okay? So sometimes that DNA analysis helps to fill in the gaps, those gaps that, that are created for many reasons. Um, when you do these kinds of analyses, you might just find some ancestral lineage that you didn't know you had ancestors from. And I would say, when you encounter something like that in the DNA story, go back to the history story and look at it from a different perspective and with a new set of glasses or a new focus. Because perhaps when you do that reanalysis, you'll realize, oh, 
maybe what I thought meant this actually means something different, okay? Um, you will inevitably get so many emails from the testing companies identifying new relatives. Um, you have more cousins than you want. I have a lot of cousins, a lot. My mother is one of 14 children. I have a lot, lot, lot of cousins. Um, you know, but they're not only, the testing companies are not only going to tell you about the people who you actually know are your cousins, they're gonna tell you about everybody you share 0.03% DNA with. And it's okay. You know, we have to keep crowd sizes down now because of COVID. And even if you didn't have to keep crowd sizes down, if you share less than a percentage of DNA with somebody, it's all right. You are not required to invite them to your Christmas Eve Réveillon. So where did I get my genes? Um, that little girl with the terribly messy hair is me. And uh, about, I don't know, 54 years ago or so, I don't know, um, when I was in kindergarten. And the two people that you see there in their youth, in their prime, before the seven of us um, exhausted them are my parents, my father, Warren Anthony Bell Sr., um, and my mother, Emma Blanche Rose Ricard Bell, and I have to include all of her names in order to tell her story, um, because her names are of, for our family, historical significance. So my parents met in uh, 1949, got married in 1950, and my oldest brother was born in 1951. Um, my mother was born in Point Coupee Parish, Louisiana. My father was born in the city of New Orleans. But both of them have several ge generations of family from Louisiana. And so let's take a quick run through of that. So long before I ever took a DNA test, I knew that I was a black woman whose ancestry like so many black people's ancestry, like so many people's ancestry in Louisiana was, was somewhat mixed. I knew that many of the names in my family tree were typical Louisiana sounding French names, right? I knew that my maternal grandmother, um, Anne Colombo Ricard, did not know her parents at all. She was raised by people who said they were her family members. She was told that her father was Italian and that her mother was Creole and had died in childbirth. That is the extent of what she knew. And I knew a lot about my, my maternal grandfather, Albert Francois Ricard Sr. The reason I knew so much about him is not because of anything that I did, but one of my cousins, was absolutely a landmark Louisiana genealogist and historian. And so he traced our Ricard family line for multiple, multiple generations. So I have always had a wealth of information about this branch of my family tree, but I had almost no knowledge of the other four branches of my family tree. So I'll share with you some little bits of information that I have today. So this is my grandfather, Joseph Bell. His parents, uh, Jerome Bell and Adele Darensburg, and then grandparents for each of those. So we have information about, so me, my parents, one, two, three, four, five, six generations. Um, of my Bell family line. However, 15 years ago, when I got to this point with Alfred Bell and Ann Prevost, I was on Ancestry.com and I said, oh, this is a dead end because Ancestry.com for this couple keeps sending me to Maryland and I don't know. I'm kind of confused. I'm not sure if these are the right two names and I don't know where they were really from, but surely I have no American ancestry anywhere outside of Louisiana and anything other than French. Me 15 years ago. Okay. All right. 
I may or may not have been wrong about that, um, as my DNA results suggest, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. Um, these are some pictures of some of my ancestors on my Bell side. So this is a photograph of my paternal grandfather, Joseph Bell. I did not know him. Um, my father truly did not know his father. Um, his father um, married someone other than my grandmother and they moved across the country. And so my father had no relationship with his father and did not know his half siblings. But through my sister's diligence, um, we have managed to secure a photograph of my father, of my grandfather, my father's father, and some other members of his family. So a grand uncle, a grand aunt, and a great grand uncle are shown here. To look at the other part of my paternal line, my grandmother, Jean Vigne, who I knew very, very well, um, her father was Jean Vigne, sometimes spelled with an S, sometimes without an S. And it is the family tomb from the Veens that my brother is in the process of restoring. So more information about this part of the family tree is being unfolded now. In fact, some of these probably can be filled in at this point. Um, I have to make a couple of phone calls to my brother and one of my cousins for some additional information about that. But we are learning some more about this part, this Veen part of my family tree. Um, as far as we know, the Veen from this generation on um, were in France. So we believe Jean Veen here was indeed born in France and um, immigrated to Louisiana sometime in the mid 1800s. Um, not much at this point is known about the Ralph line. Um, but again, there are some cousins who are working on this branch of the family tree. So that is something that I'll certainly um, be able to add to very soon. And some pictures of my Veen uh, ancestors. This is my grandmother, Jeanne, um, Mama Jeanne, as I called her, and her brother, my uncle, my great uncle, Arthur. Um, and this is my grandmother's mother. And this gentleman at the drums is my grandmother's father. That is Jean Grady Red uh, Veen. Um, significant to me to note that um, my great grandfather was indeed a drummer, considered one of the important drummers in the early years of jazz in New Orleans because he had a couple of children who were very well respected, gifted musicians. And my father was a gifted musician. And I'm sure I shouldn't brag about my son, but um, my son picks up any instrument lightning fast. And so as a person who believes that genes are important in almost everything that we do, I like to think when I hear my son play the saxophone or the piano or participate in the drum line with his school, I like to think that although I have no musical talent, that he got that through my Veen ancestry. Um, on my mother's side of the family, again, this is the work of my cousin, Ulysses S. Ricard, um, who was, again, really, really a landmark genealogist for the state of Louisiana. So I am eighth generation South Louisiana on my mother's side of the family. Um, Albert Francois, uh, excuse me, Albert Francois Ricard was my grandfather. And we can trace that Ricard branch of the family tree all the way to Antoine de Riotour de Ricard, who was born in France, um, came to Louisiana in the 1740s-ish. Um, so, you know, I've been here in Louisiana before Louisiana was part of the United States, and uh, I am proud of that. It is probably the reason there are some things that are not quite right about me, um, but I also like to think it's the reason that anything that is good about me is good, okay? Um, Antoine de Riotour de Ricard was a typical Caucasian Frenchman, and Marianne, you see we have no last name for her because she was a woman of color. And these are my 
maternal grandparents who I also knew very well, Albert Francois. Um, sometimes he said Albert Francois was his name. Sometimes he said Francois Albert um, and, and Colombo Ricard, my grandmother. Um, additional um, ancestors on that Ricard line. So this is uh, Joseph Farragut Ricard, um, my great grandfather, and Rosalie Rachel Blanche Ricard, my great grandmother. And I emphasize the Blanche because my mother, Emma Blanche, was named with the Blanche after her grandmother. And Rosalie Blanche had an identical twin sister whose name was Rose. And so my mother's confirmation name, Rose, remember I said the Emma Blanche Rose, was after her grandmother's identical twin. And I even have this picture, which is of my great, great grandparents, Joseph Aristide Ricard and Felicity Honoré Ricard. So I have several generations of names and stories, at least of where they lived, um, and census records to document that, and even a few pictures of people for several generations. And then you get to my mother's mother. And you see, this is a blank chart. Um, my mother's mother, Anne Colombo, born in 1890 in Point Coupee, Louisiana. She was told that her father was Selma Colombo and that he was Italian. And she was told that her mother was Cornelia Mathis and that, oh, your mother died in childbirth. And that's kind of the end of this story. Perhaps her father was Etienne, perhaps not. Um, this is the greatest mystery of my family tree. Um, and so perhaps this is the place that I really need to start working. You know, the fact that she was not raised by her parents, and we are certain that her father was perhaps an Italian, but Caucasian, um, you know, he may have had a legal wife and children, maybe, I don't know that. Um, but he might have had a legal wife and children that caused him to distance himself from my grandmother. Um, and with her mother dying in childbirth, she had no direct familial relationships. She had no knowledge of her ancestors in order to share with us. So this truly is our mystery. I sometimes say, okay, my grandmother must have, you know, risen from the foam of the sea because you know, or the foam of false river or something, um, because we really know nothing about her. All right, so when I did my 23andMe analysis, which is about, I don't know, six years ago, perhaps, um, this is a picture of me, the fat face in the front, um, and my mother, my father, my younger sister, my older sister, and my four big brothers, um, that picture was taken in December of 1967, and I know that for sure because I know my sister is a newborn baby right there, and I know this picture was taken on a Christmas day. Um, so this is December 1967. Um, these are the ancestry numbers that I received from the 23andMe analysis that I had. Um, so 23, you know, 35% Sub-Saharan African, um, and then all of these other percentages, mostly of European countries, um, teeny tiny little bit, they couldn't figure out belong anywhere, um, and almost nothing in terms of either Northern African or Native American ancestry. And so what questions did I have when I saw these numbers? Well, um, what? 19.8? You mean to tell me there's 20% British and Irish? Who is that? Who, who is that? That didn't make sense to me. That didn't make sense with anything I knew about who I was, anything I knew about my family history, with any of the names that I knew. 16.2% um, Iberian. Again, Iberian, Spain and Portugal. I don't know of any Spanish or Portuguese ancestor. That's certainly not indicated on the extensive family tree for my recard line. And none of the others seem obviously like Spanish or Portuguese names and are the other names that I know. So I don't fully understand that. Um, the French and the Italian. 
wait a minute. You know, half of the names in my lineage are French names. How can I possibly only have 2.6% French um, SNPs? That, that can't be accurate. And did somebody lie to my grandmother about her father being Italian because 2% Italian? I should have at least 10% Italian if her father was indeed um, Italian. So this doesn't make sense. This is confusing. I don't know who that is. This is confusing. I don't know who that is. And, you know, a majority of African Americans think they have some Native American ancestry. I certainly assumed it in my youth, but 23andMe tells me, no, you don't. Right? So how do I think I might one day be able to answer these mysteries, these places where the history um, that I know or think I know, and the genetic ancestry that I now have, those are places where it kind of doesn't match. Well, maybe, the British and Irish. Remember 15 years ago when I came up with Alfred Bell, came across the names Alfred Bell and Anne Prevost as possible great, great, great grandparents, and they kept putting me toward Maryland, and I said, that's an, a mistake in ancestry because those people aren't French and those people are in Maryland. And so that's not part of my lineage. Maybe ancestry wasn't wrong. Maybe, I don't know for sure, um, but I'm certainly no longer convinced that ancestry was wrong because the fact that there is such that significant percentage of British and Irish and that location that is not French, Louisiana, possibly that Maryland and Alfred Bell and Anne Prevost connection is the source of where the British and Irish comes in, perhaps. I don't know that for sure, right? And then the Iberian. Well, my maternal grandmother, remember as a child, she was told your father is Italian, your mother died in childbirth. She did not know either one of her parents. So it is certainly possible that the Iberian ancestry that 23andMe has detected is coming from that big blank space question mark that I have in my own ancestry, okay? Um, then those teeny tiny percentages of French and Italian that I absolutely expected to be higher. Well, again, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, migration did not begin with the Wright brothers. People walked from country to country as long as people walked, which is since the beginning of humans, right? So those differences from one country to another country within the same continent are not necessarily accurate. And also, if we go back to the previous one, there is here 14 and another five, about 20% that is considered like broadly European. Broadly Northwestern European could easily, easily be French, okay? And broadly Southern European, broadly European could easily, easily be Italian. Again, perhaps I will never be able to prove this with any, with, you know, with, with certainly not with a scientific level of certainty, but broadly European very certainly could be French and the broadly European, broadly Southern European could be Italian, which would put these two numbers back into a range that gels more easily with the family history stories that I have. Um, so that's kind of where um, I stand in terms of my own ancestry. You know, if I put the broadly European things with French and Italian, that makes sense. And even there's, there's some um, belief among genetic genealogists that those alleles, those um, SNPs that pop up as Iberian, um, 
there's a lot of overlap between the Iberian SNPs and the southern coast of France all the way into um, Italy, across over and into Italy. So basically the very, very southern tip that border along the Mediterranean, a lot of the alleles that are present there um, are very common with the alleles that are present for the Iberian Peninsula. So that's another potential uh, reason that this large percentage that I can't quite understand could be showing itself in my uh, ancestry report. So um, why am I interested in this? Obviously I'm a geneticist. I've always kind of liked historical stuff. Even the things I binge watch tend to have a historical um, stint to them. Um, I do this because I hope that the future generations of my family appreciate the stories that we have gathered as much as I do. And just in case any of the future generations of my family appreciate those stories, I would like to have records to share with them. And so I show you here um, my niece Brianna and one of her babies and my niece Brittany and one of her babies. Um, because I hope that if any one of them ever comes to me as the old lady in the family and asks questions, I want to be able to answer them for them. And of all the things and ways that I can define myself and describe myself, without argue, the two most important things about me are who I came from and who I have produced. And in this picture, you see a very recent, recent picture just two weeks before my mother passed away in May of 2021, um, when we celebrated her 91st birthday, who I came from, Emma Blanche Rose, Ricard Bell, and who I have produced my one and only baby, who knows that he is a ninth generation Louisiana, um, Lambert Charles Boissier IV, even a different Louisiana um, story to tell there. Um, but it's very important to me, the connection between myself and my mother, myself and my son, but most importantly, my son and my mother and all of those that came before her. I thank you so much for your time, for your attention this morning. And um, with that, I think I will turn it back over to Heather. I think she has a few announcements um, and I believe we're gonna have a couple of questions. That was so excellent. Thank you so much, Michelle, for taking time out of your Saturday to present to us. Um, Amanda's going to have some follow up things to say as well before we open it up for questions. So please start um, writing que questions into the chat. I know some of you also emailed Michelle, um, emailed Amanda about the questions. I just wanted to bring up an opportunity. If any of you have um, family that is from the state of Mississippi, they currently have a fellowship available for genealogical research. The application process closes this Tuesday at five o'clock. So I just wanted to show you all this. I'm gonna quickly share my screen. Um, okay, so if you, we'll put the link in the chat as well for this but they're offering $2,000 to 10 different researchers to be able to fund their travel to Jackson, Mississippi and for their accommodation for three days to use the archives. This is a really fantastic opportunity and resource. I know a lot of you do have family ties to the state of Mississippi. So I just wanted to make this available to you. Um, and I'll just copy that right now and put it in the chat. The other thing I wanted to mention as a plug for New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, if you don't follow us on Facebook or get our newsletter, March 19th, we're going to have our very first St. Joseph's Day altar, which will be in the chapel within St. Joseph Cemetery number one. And I'm currently looking for committee members. So if any of you want to join me for that, um, committee members will be responsible for helping me plan the event, maybe doing some outreach, different organizations, trying to get the supplies for the altar and just the planning for the day. It's as little or as much as you want to participate, but please email me if you are interested or if you have any other questions about the cemeteries themselves. I'm always happy to connect with you all. 
going to turn it over to Amanda, but thank you again, Michelle. This was so, this was better than I even expected it to be. This was fantastic. I'm so pleased. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes, it, it, it was absolutely incredible, Michelle. Like I, I learned so much and I had a lot of, you, you really like outline concepts that I'd been like, had nebulously in my mind, but you were able to define them all and relate them exactly to how- Well, I then you can take the final exam. <laughs> Everybody's gonna get that in their email, by the way. So, yep. <laughs> so, you know, make sure you took notes, just kidding. But we are going to record this, so that's good. Um, I wanna thank Heather for like presenting that opportunity. It is a great opportunity. And yes, I mean, <laughs> many of us have Mississippi ancestors, so this is fabulous. Um, so um, it's it's question time. I know a lot of y'all, there is not a handout, Suzanne, but there will be a recording. We will have it on YouTube next week. So if you ever need to revisit and take more notes, it will be there for you. Um, I'm also going to put a link to the video on our website, nolacatholiccemeteries.org, and where I have all the recordings of past lectures. So it'll also be available there for a direct link which in a second, when we start the question and answer session, I'm going to put up all our contact information and it's gonna have um, the uh, nolacatholiccemeteries.org website address. It'll have the city archives and um, we'll have our emails on there as well. Um, so uh, we're going to engage in the question and answer session now. For those of you who uh, want to stick around, you can uh, start typing your questions into chat. Um, I know a lot of people already asked some questions, which I've been recording. So I'm going to intersperse um, questions from folks who waited until this section with the questions that were already presented will alternate. Um, let's see here. Let's, let's start with Teresa. Um, Thank you, Teresa. Um, so T Teresa asks, um, I've been informed that my siblings may receive a different report that may shed light on ancestors. So is it worthwhile for all siblings to have DNA testing? Hmm. You know, it, to a certain extent, yes, it's, it's valuable for more people to have testing just from the you know, from a purely scientific standpoint, the more information you have, the more accurate your decision making, your interpretation will be. So I would say yes, um, if you could have more than one sibling do the test, it's probably a good thing. Do I expect them to be, to be the results to be significantly different? No. Um, of my seven siblings, three of us have had the testing, three of us, one, two, three, four of us um, have had the testing done. And um, everybody has shared their numbers with me, and I computed the the averages, et cetera, et cetera, because you know I do that kind of stuff. Um, but the the general patterns are very much the same, and even more than the general patterns, you know, even when you get down a little bit to the detail, there's obviously it's obviously if we didn't already know it, yeah, we would know we were brother and sister. <laughs> Um, if we didn't already know it, but again, the more information you have, the better, and the more accurate your overall set of information is. Excellent. Okay, good. I think that um, may cover a lot of that. And and some of these questions, like the answers, may overlap. I'm going to go ahead and um, ask them anyway. But you can always say, as I said before, <laughs> if that would, yeah. if, if that makes no it easier. Um, the next one I have from is Diane. Uh, she said, I ordered DNA testing through Ancestry. They continuously send updated results would drastically differ from what I was originally sent. There are categories that I am now that were not included initially and categories I was at first that are now gone. Uh, one was almost 60% initially and now is only 20%. Um, it says, isn't DNA a hard science? But I think we explained a lot lot of this about by discussing the SNPs that each company uses and how they evolve over time. But uh, the main question is, how can my makeup change so drastically? Is this even reliable? So your makeup did not change. You are who you are. You know, your SNPs are the same today um, that they were the day, not only the day you were born, the day you were conceived, right? My hunch is, they that company must have had a a change in their algorithm. So 
I, I too occasionally get updates, but for me, the updates have never made a change of more than two or 3% here or there in either direction. So it was nothing alarming or um, confusing to me. If you saw a percentage go from 60% to 20%, they must have developed a completely different algorithm to do a reanalysis of the data. That's the only way to explain that. Excellent, okay. Um, my next question is going to be from uh, Kendrick. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Kendrick asks, I believe I heard that it's not possible to trace ancestry to specific Native American tribes. Is this true? Do you know? I don't know that much about um, tracing ancestry to the specific tribes. And, you know, there may be, um, there may be, I don't know, there may be a company out there that offers that type of service. However, the accuracy of the service, I would tell you, you know, really take that with a grain of salt simply because the num the sample size of people with, you know, a significant portion of Native American ancestry is very small. So there aren't that many people with Indigenous American ancestry who are in the database for either 23andMe or Ancestry DNA or any of the other big companies. So when you have a very, very small number of people who have been tested, the ability to draw really, you know, conclusions that you can be confident in is going to be very limited. So I imagine if everyone who had Indigenous American ancestry, you know, knew their tribal origin and also had the DNA analysis done, you might be able to draw some really good conclusions. But at this point in time, the number of people who, you know, who have done the testing is so small, I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't put a whole lot of confidence in it. Okay, and, and, and a second question since we're here. Um, could it be that some of your family were free people of color in the 18th century, had ancestors in Hispaniola or Cuba, which may have uh, an intermixture of Spanish and African? Possibly. Um, you know, I don't know that in the story, but knowing how long everyone has been in, you know, how, how long people on my, my mother's side for sure have been in Louisiana and even on part of my dad's side have been in New Orleans for, you know, several generations. I don't know that as part of the story, but there are a couple of places where I know nothing of the story. Um, in fact, uh, you know, as you say, there was one suggestion before my cousin Ulysses passed away um, he died 28 years ago, um, much too early. But there was one suggestion that perhaps my grandmother's mother um, was Haitian. And so, you know, if she was Caribbean at all, that could have brought in the Spanish, you know, from the Caribbean. But I, I don't know that for sure. Right, right. Yeah, it, it's speculation, but mm -hmm. and in a large research project in the future. <laughs> um, Again, I have to retire first. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Before you start your next your next yeah, career. Um, My hobby. But um, uh, okay. Next question. Um, this may be a little complicated, so if we can't like truly answer it here, we could always uh, say uh, email um, us. But uh, how can I use the DNA results of first cousins, first cousins once removed to identify my late father's biological mother? Ooh, um, yeah, it might be a little complicated. All right, so if you have DNA results from several branches of her offspring, um, so in other words, not just from you and your own siblings, um, but from people who you know are first cousins, et cetera, that possibly that might be able to help you, but it's going to require you to have access to data for people that you perhaps don't know that you are related to, right? Um, in other words, I'm assuming if you don't know who that individual is or grandmother, 
if your first cousins also don't know who she was, then you're going to have to rely on having either nieces or nephews of hers or um, grandchildren of hers who perhaps did know her. So you're going to have to have information from people that you might not know in order to make a prediction about who she might have been. Um, yes, yeah, so, it, you know, you have limited, you, you have access to these testing services of the data that you put in there and data that other people say is open for sharing. But there might be people who could give you that information, but that you don't have the access to their data. You know, so it's kind of tricky. You almost have to have someone who who has a broader access than the average individual has. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, so it's, is it possible? That, it is possible. Right. <laughs> but with the, with the level of access that we have, not really. Um, let's see here. Uh, Melissa asks, why is my DNA with my brother a larger percent in common versus my sister? Crossing over. <laughs> <laughs> Crossing over. I mean, technically it's possible, right? Um, it is, since your mother gave you 50% of her DNA and your father gave you 50% of his DNA, and they also gave each of your siblings the same thing. So technically, it's possible, mathematically, you know, unlikely, but it's possible that the 50% of your mother's DNA that you received and the 50% of your mother's DNA that your sister received, maybe there were the exact opposite 50%, right? So it's normally not that cut and dry in terms of the percentages. In fact, it is crossing over is completely random. Um, crossing over is healthy. Um, it actually ensures a healthy embryo and a healthy pregnancy and all that kind of stuff, but it's completely random. So, you know, is it possible to have a significant percentage that is different? Yeah, it sure is. I think this also, your answer also relates to a question that Emily had earlier that said, I wonder if crossing over is responsible for why children often look like their aunts and uncles. And I'm assuming, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, a lot of times we'll say, oh, people skip, gener you know, characteristics skip generations. You know, a child will look, looks more like a grandparent than they do like their actual parents. Um, and yes, that def definitely uh, plays a role in that. Um, the next question we had was from Monique. Um, did commu did completion of the Human Genome Project propel, int propel interest in and production of clones? Oh Lord, um, <laughs> I don't know if it propelled interest, but um, unfortunately, it's more doable. Mm -hmm. So makes sense. Um, the technology to clone any living organism, including a human, you know, if somebody had that desire to do so in 1980, you know, nice that you have that desire, you know, but you can't because it's just not reasonable or possible. Because of the ease with which genes can be analyzed today, that also increases the ease with which genes can be copied and therefore the ease with which cloning could happen. So I don't know that it changed the interest level, but it most certainly um, made it more feasible, more doable a task. Right, right. Excellent. Um, my next question is from George. My paternal line is well documented to Southwest Germany, but ancestry DNA shows very little percentage of Northwest European and no mention of Germany. Is this common? Um, if the report does include things like um, either another country that shares a border with Germany, like perhaps Germany and France, um, or if it indicates, you know, as mine does, some of this not specified but European. So perhaps it says, you know, like uncategorized um, European, then it might be safe to assume that the uncategorized European is actually German. And because also, there are some SNPs that are common throughout the European continent. So just because it's considered an uncategorized European SNP doesn't mean it isn't from Germany. 
It just means that in addition to Germany, there are people with that SNP who are also in France. And that makes sense because he does mention Southwest Germany, which is yes. where, the border, where, the, where the border would be. Close to the Mediterranean, et cetera. Right. Um, so it is common then, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my next question is, I'm not sure I understand it entirely. Um, it, it says SNP. If one has an L, but one has a C, are they related? Might need hmm. to read. That must be a typo because there is no L. Okay. It, yeah. Um, we can we can uh, come back to that, or okay. or if you could email us the question again. That's why I don't know if you're if you're asking like if a, I don't have the exact same SNPs as either of my siblings, mm -hmm. right? So it's possible for us for me to have a SNP on in one location on one particular chromosome that one of my siblings doesn't have that exact same SNP at that location. That's the reason my shared ancestry with my siblings, with all of them, again, you know, four of us have had the ancestry analysis done, and the shared ancestry with them ranges from like 48 to 52%, right? Um, so I'm not 100% identical to either of my siblings. So it's okay for two siblings to have a SNP that they don't share in common. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, um, and it, yeah, and I remember you addressing it. Um, let's see here. Uh, and, and Kendrick just says, thanks for your answer uh, regarding the earlier question. He just, or uh, they just remembered uh, when Elizabeth Warren said she had proof, but the Native American community said that the DNA ca testing can't prove that. So that was- Yeah, it's the, again, the number of people who, who have been, who, the number of people who are, you know, Native American, who have had the ancestry done is such a small number. It's, you know, it's hard to to have any scientifically um, approved documentation of that. Mm -hmm. So Emily asked, um, so when a DNA company sends you these updates to your ancestor profile, as they commonly do, is this from new SNPs from other folks that have been analyzed? Um, not necessarily new SNPs, but yes, from data from new people and looking at the data from new people. And again, the companies are constantly sort of tweaking their mathematical analysis, you know, and making little, sub usually it's subtle changes, but every time 10,000 more people do the test, then that could lead to a shift in how the, the, the numbers are analyzed. And more and more people are purchasing the tests every day. Right. Um, let's see here. And then um, uh, Leonard, Leonard said, great presentation. And he says, for what it's worth, he ran across the Prevost Sermon in Paris at Père Lachaise Cemetery and took a photo of the tomb because he went to school and grew up with some Prevost. Really? OK. <laughs> Leonard knows everybody. Ah, uh, OK. Let's see here. Um, okay, and then uh, here's a question from Teresa. Uh, my oldest relatives who've been tested have yielded some of the most significant results. Would you consider testing your elders a priority? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes, because, uh, you know, um, they're not going to be here that long. So if you decide, uh, it, depending on how old you mean by elder, you know, if you decide 10 years from now, that you would like to have that generation. And the more generations you have, the better, I would say. Um, so absolutely. Um, we had my mother um, analyzed before she passed away a couple of years ago, we had her analyzed. Um, so now actually, you know, I look at it from the perspective of my son, my son is 19. And so he's had his 23 and me done. And so has, me, you know, me and my husband, both his grandparents on my husband's side, my mother, and three of his aunts and uncles on my side. So he has himself, his mother and father, his paternal grandparents, his one of his maternal grandparents, and multiple aunts, uncles, and first cousins um, on his maternal side. 
So he has a better, fuller picture of his genetic ancestry than most people do. It's not possible for me to have that fuller picture because my father had passed away before this technology was developed, right? And all of my grandparents had long since passed away before this technology was available. So however many generations there are, yes, to have at least one person from each generation, I think is ideal. I muted myself, oopsie. Um, <laughs> here so um we have another question from susan that i wanted to get to because our next question is from uh on the on the pre-question side is from somebody who already had one question um mm -hmm. susan says we're having a family squabble over comparing dna and primary records regarding a great grandmother historical records say one name and amateur dna na analysis says another i'm presuming that oral history favors the white woman rather than the biracial woman this must happen often, and I don't know how to resolve the he said, she said aspect. This is a this is a doozy, Susan. Lordy, lordy. Okay. Um, <laughs> wow, there's a lot to unpack there. So, uh, you know, I, I kind of want to have a conversation with her. Um, so are you saying that historical records say that she was Caucasian and genetic records say that she was biracial? I'm, I, from what I'm reading in this question, I do, if Susan is no longer here or if she is, um, uh, is Susan still here? I, if you, if you don't mind chiming in, Susan, um, I'm assuming that historical records may be favoring white and DNA analysis may be favoring biracial. Because that is something that I've seen certainly happen. Because that um, that happens sometimes. Yeah. I mean, you know, as I I I alluded to, um, you know, there are many cases, especially when we're talking about, you know, in South Louisiana, where you have all of these people who are of mixed ancestral, you know, this genetic admixture. Some of them don't particularly look like they are the um, genetic admixture that they are. Right. And so records, in fact, the historical records can be um, the place where you can lie. You can lie about what your ancestry is when the census taker knocks on your door. Right. You are not really in control of what the DNA says. So, uh, for see, example, Susan, uh, she, in, she says it's the opposite. Um, that census say biracial, DNA says white. That is, um, it's possible. interesting. <laughs> it's not the only time, it's more rare, but it's not the only time I've heard that, to be honest with you. Um, so if the DNA says white and the census says biracial, right? Okay. It's possible that she was a white woman who was going to marry a black man and it wasn't possible for him to move into her world but it was possible for her to live in his world and so she might have had to pretend that she too was black or pretend that she was biracial in order to you know, live in his community, or perhaps it was even assumed that she was because she was living in that black community. So I have heard of other instances where that has happened. So it, it's certainly possible. Um, again, naturally I'm a biologist. So, um, you know, I'm gonna say most likely the DNA report is the accurate one. Because again, you can't lie. The DNA testing company can make a mistake but you can't lie on your DNA analysis, but you can lie on an historical record. I, I wonder if perhaps this, this if, if that was the case and the marriage predates um, uh, loving, uh, yes. the loving yes. decision by the mm -hmm. Supreme Court about interracial marriage. Yes. That would be the way to- That would be, again, so I'm, I'm talking about something that happened before that, right. Yeah. 
Um, okay. That's, oh, she assumes uh, and adds a comment now that she thinks people are fibbing on names. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> listen, um, when you're doing ancestry, whether you're doing it from historical records or you're doing it from the DNA testing, you are going to come across people who have, who have fibbed, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to their children, to their spouses, um, to census takers, to everybody who they could talk to. It, it happens, you know, it happens all the time. You know, my mother, like, again, I said earlier, my mother is one of 14 children. Um, four of my mother's siblings lived as wife their entire adult lives. And most of them never told their children that they were anything other than Caucasian. So I have a whole set of first cousins who grew up not knowing that they had any African ancestry. I think all of them do today, but many of them didn't know until, you know, in my adulthood and in their adulthood, and they're all older than I am. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 um quite quite a quite a knot to untangle. It uh, is, it really is. I wanted to get to uh Iman's question. Um Iman says, I am a native New Orleanian with diverse ancestry. I have been conducting genealogy research, but I'm stuck due to slavery. What are your recommendations for hiring a genealogist to assist with conducting research? Ooh, I'll have to look into that and get it because I, I would have to look into that. I have a couple of um, names that kind of pop into my head. Um, maybe maybe if, if Iman could email Dr. Um, Dr. That's Boyd. fine. That's fine. I'll see if I can put you in touch with someone. And especially if you are a native, Nor especially if you're a native New Orleanian, you kind of want somebody who understands this um, confusing community. Mm. I just wanted to mention our April lecture, which has not been announced yet, is going to focus on just that. So um, awesome. stay tuned for those details. But we're going to present a lecture. Um, by a very talented historian who focuses on on those kind of um, topics. So, yeah, like be, getting stuck due to slavery and yes. it, when doing when conducting your genealogy research and we how to get around it. it in passing in some of our um, in some of our lectures as well, which you can find on our YouTube channel. But um, generally, um, it, it it does depend on if you want to conduct the. Uh, the research yourself versus hiring somebody. So that's that's why it would be a good question for email. You know, my, I often watch um, the PBS program, Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates. And um, sometimes my son watches it with me. And he always says, you know, instead of doing famous people who can afford to hire somebody to do this for them, he should do some regular people. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you're right. Because <laughs> he, has, he has a full team, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see. And I see Patricia. I've gotten to the point in the chat where Patricia clarified that she meant an I and a C, but I believe you already answered that. Got question. It. Got it. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, Monique has some complicated, more complicated questions that I might um, recommend um, a for, for an email because they're uh, more bi biologically. Um, but the questions okay. are, how are mutations represented in DNA chromosomes? Um, what parts of cells are studied in the research of mutations? And does each singular sperm from a male contain the same or different chromosomal patterns? So uh, one, how are mutations represented in the DNA? So mutations happen at random. Um, mutations happen as accidents during cell division. Um, as accidents during expression or using the genes, they just happen at random. Most of the time mutations are, you know, single or individual nucleotides that are changing, right? And can a mutation be the source of a SNP? Absolutely. A random uh, mutation can be the source of a new SNP. But the SNPs that are analyzed in these um, testing services are SNPs that are commonly found and that have been in existence for a long time 
So it's not like a, a new random mutation that would be contributing to any of the um, algorithms, right? Next part of the question, um, I know there was something about does the, the complement of chromosomes that are present in a sperm. No, the complement of chromosomes that are present in a sperm is different for every sperm that is made by that man. Um, yeah. Because in the man, there's also crossing over going on with his pair of chromosomes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so the, a father will donate to his children a different and unique um, set of genes every time um, he produces sperm. Right, because uh, the XY chromosome is what leads to the, the union becoming the, the, a right. or a girl. The X, the X or Y, so whether or not the man um, produces a sperm that has an X or a Y, and men produce 50% of their sperm have an X, and 50% of their sperm have a Y. Um, but as far as the other 44 chromosomes, they're all undergoing crossing over, just like the chromosomes in, in females are. Um, yes. And so uh, let's see here. Uh, next question. From this side, uh, okay, family squabble, I, I. Um, David Woodward, I, I'm not sure, David. Uh, it said, how do I get the most results from my Y-DNA test from familytreedna.com? And I'm not sure, that may be a question for them. Um, Probably so. Yeah, you may want to find the contact info on familytreedna.com and ask them. So some, I know that some of the companies don't give you a Y analysis at all. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them don't give you a mitochondrial analysis at all. Mm -hmm. You'll um, have to check with the company. Yeah, but you really would have to go direct to the company for that. Right. Um, I have a question from Bonnie. Um, Ancestry.com finds a distant cousin with whom I share maybe just 1% DNA. They then check the trees we have and find a common ancestor. What kind of confidence can I have in this match? I guess it depends on how far away the ancestor is, at least partially. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, 1% is really small. And if you look for a family tree connection, you know, from the historical documents, et cetera, et cetera, and truly cannot find anything. So in other words, if you are in communication with that individual and they trace their family lineage back several generations and you trace yours back several generations and you find no overlap, um, no people even living in the same communities, then you have to wonder if that 1% share is you know, legitimately someone who is a relative or, you know, if that's sort of one of those coincidences, random coincidences that, you know, you're going to share DNA with other people. Um, you know, about a year or so ago, uh, most of the messages that I get from 23andMe, I completely ignore because it's like, okay, yeah, 0.8%, keep going. You know, 0.9%, keep going. I have 60 first cousins, but, you know, whatever. I don't need any more cousins. And about, it's probably two years ago now, because I do think it was right before the pandemic, I um, don't think about it. You know, I get this 23 and me, oh, you have new relatives. Uh-huh, sure I do. You know, and I'm glancing, ignoring, glancing, ignoring, whatever, and just about to close. And I realized there's one with 8% shared DNA. And I said, oh, that is not a coincidence. I'm like, 0.8% is a coincidence. 8% is not a coincidence. And I sent a message to that person saying, um, you know, who are you? Because the name was totally meaningless to me. I, no connection to the name at all. Um, and of course I did a minute of, you know, social media stalking. I found her Facebook page and I'm looking at her going, I don't know this person, who is this? She doesn't live here. She doesn't live anywhere that I know of any of my family being, what is this? As it turns out, my mother's oldest brother was one of her siblings who had, you know, moved out west and lived as white his entire life. She was his granddaughter. So she is indeed my cousin. Um, 
And, you know, I had no idea who she was. She had no idea who I was. She said she did know that her grandparents were from Louisiana and they had sort of suggested that their ancestry was a little mixed, but haven't given them, had not given them any details. Um, so she wasn't shocked and, you know, and or disturbed by finding out that she was related to me. Um, but yeah, when I saw that 8%, I knew to investigate that a little bit further. That makes sense. So, so 1%, I don't know. I think, I think ultimately, yeah. uh, ultimately, Bonnie, I, even if you do have a common ancestor in the family tree, it, it's it probably several generations removed. DNA result, you know? Um, it's, 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 it's really hard to say, but unlikely that you should have. Right, but it might be so far removed, you know? Yeah. You know, again, you, you almost have to ask yourself, how distant a cousin do I want or need to be claiming um, to be connected with? You know, if somebody's a fourth cousin twice removed, you know. Maybe. But, yeah, you know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. <laughs> Let's see here. I'm going to try to get to um, just the, the rest of the questions um, we have from folks that haven't had a chance before. Um, uh, Philippe asks, uh, what about false negative results? What are the chances that someone you know is your second cousin will not show a DNA test match? If that happens, could they still be a biological relative? Or do we know for sure there was a non-parental event? Um, unfortunately, it's probably more likely that there was a non-parental event. Okay. Um, you know, again, a second cousin is close enough that the testing services are pretty accurate up until that point. And while, yes, technically it's possible that every common ancestor that you guys have had these really bizarre um, patterns of crossing over so that you didn't inherit any of the same genes. Like y'all had 100% opposite. Yeah. Of over. <laughs> so could that happen? Yes. But the chances of that happening are really, really unlikely. So probably a non-parental event. Probably a non-parental event. Like There's probably some, probably someone has um, kept a secret. Okay, that's a great question, Philippe. I'm glad we got to it. Um, Vanessa, um, Vanessa asks, we tested my mother and four of her children on 23andMe. They offered a projected DNA report on my father. How accurate do you think this could be? Um, <laughs> not super, super accurate. I mean, listen, so if you have several siblings, um, you know, they haven't offered me that yet. Um, but if you have several siblings who've all used the same testing company and your mother, then everything that they get <clears throat> from your siblings, <clears throat> excuse me, that they can tell did not come from your mother, had to come from your father, right? And if the things they get from you and your siblings <coughs> that were not from your mother are kind of the same things, <coughs> excuse me, it's not as accurate as doing a test on your father, but it's not completely inaccurate either. I'm so sorry, Emily. I think I think we are straining your voice. So much all right, it's all right, no problem. <clears throat> Um, we're oh, all I mean, listen, is it, it again, it's not as accurate as actually doing a test on your father. Clearly not. But if you have enough siblings, well, yeah, there, there are some things that they can determine about your father. <clears throat> I'm going to ask them to do that for us. That's truly interesting. Three, because three of the four of us, of my siblings, are on the same company, 23andMe, as is my mother. So they might be able to do that for us, too. Ooh, that's really neat, actually. I'd love it. That is you know, listen, I've tempted, you know, 23andMe can only use the saliva sample, right? That's that's what they do it on. 
But, um, you know, I've been tempted to spend the money to get somebody to extract DNA from something that it's a little harder to extract DNA from. Like, I still have some saxophone reeds that my father used. So there is a chance that some of his DNA is on those. And I would love to have that analysis. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're, we're probably going to have to wind down. I'm going to try to get to as many unique questions. Patricia, I know you had a lot, a lot of questions. Um, it might be um, if you could like email us, um, but I want to make sure that everybody uh, who, who didn't get a chance gets a chance to ask, but I don't want to put any, I don't want to put too much more strain on your vocal cords. You've given us so much today, Michelle. I don't want you to give us- Not a problem. Um, I have to teach again until Wednesday, so it's all right. <laughs> um, we're going to put you in a tea and honey um, <laughs> recuperation. Um, let's see here. Um, so just a few more. Uh, Paul um, discovered via an Ancestry.com DNA uh, Facebook group in which we are all connected via DNA. The group discusses connections via segments shared, i.e. 554 CM across 26 segments centimeter 554 centimeters across 26 segments it describes the proximity of how close one is related to another connected dna relative on ancestry have you used this type of data and can you explain reading this on ancestry.com in order to connect family tree members i have not used it but now i have to look at it <laughs> yeah i've never i haven't heard about that but i'm not as familiar by any means so uh, I haven't used it, but I have to. I have to look for that. And the CM is Centi Morgans. Oh, Centi Morgans, which is also what a lot of Patricia's questions relate to. Um, so definitely. Oh, okay. So you don't measure chromosomes in millimeters. Mm -hmm. You measure chromosomes in Morgans. Morgans, that's right. That's right. After the famous fruit fly geneticist Thomas Hunt Morgan, who was the first person to map gene uh, distances so. from each other. And but, you know what? Since I talked about crossing over. So the distance between two genes traditionally was described as how often they had crossing over occur in between them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the frequency of crossing over, if two genes are far apart, there's probably crossing over in between them often. If they're really close, there probably isn't crossing over between them very often. So the distance between genes is a prediction of how often crossing over occurs between them and vice versa. And that was named after one of the early geneticists who was Thomas Hunt Morgan. So it's Santi Morgan. Mm, okay, yes, yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, there's some, um, some great some great comments just um teresa says when dealing with questions of race please be open-minded about truth and records like the census look at the time and place in history which yes mm -hmm. always great advice um uh bridget bajois says i enjoyed the presentation i was surprised to find out that we're close cousins <laughs> i am the great granddaughter of rose lacour ricard and your great grandmother's twin sister okay, we are cousins <laughs> That's always See, I love there, it when this is a Louisiana it. moment. <laughs> I love it. I love it when we get a when we get um, a connection like this in the presentations. They're fabulous. Um, let's see here. Uh, and listen, um, for interest sake, I, she probably knows this. Um, is it Bajwa's last name? You know, my great great grandmother, Blanche Lacour, and her twin sister. Rose LaCour, married brothers. Identical mm. twins married two brothers. <laughs> and and Monique has a great question to end on. I'm sorry. Um and uh we'll just uh well um I'll ask um I'll see if I can like condense your questions, Patricia, into some one sort of thing, but um <clears throat> yes, uh let's see here. Um uh Monique says, what text do you use in your genetics course? I should Different know. every time? <laughs> no, 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 no. The one that's written on the syllabus is by Robert Brooker. Um, but that is a kind of general upper level science major genetics textbook. But the truth is, um, I don't teach directly from any one text. So, 
you have to attend class. Uh, my lectures are a compilation of things that I've read in several texts that I have put together in my own story, my own telling of those concepts. Um, and my upper level class, the human genetics class, which again, does a little bit of this, but does mostly um, genetics for medical purposes. Uh, the last few years, actually, I've been teaching that only from recent publications. So I have a collection of um, research articles published all within the last 10 years, and the students read those and we come to, to class together to discuss those articles. But the general genetics textbook that I use, again, is for a pre-med population. It's by Robert Brooker. Um, I believe there is a genetics textbook that is easier for a non-science art audience, um, and the author is, I believe, uh, Ricky Lewis. Yes, Robert Brooker is the right. So you have to have a year or two of biology before you get to the Brooker test. Is Lewis spelled L E W or L O U? L E W. Okay. I'm just going to put Ricky Lewis better read. That's good. <laughs> it's, yeah, it, because it is. It's, it's much and, easier. Um, you can check the. We we may have the Ricky Lewis one at the library. I would I would check nolalibrary.org and you could probably just check it out from us because I'm sure we probably have the Ricky Lewis one. We generally do not carry textbooks, unfortunately. Right. Um. But but that's it, there, there's a whole like a uh, business <laughs> thing behind that. Um. Let's see here. And Paul did Paul did have a couple of closing con connect comments about. The benefit of connecting with one percent connection might be the possibility of discovering a paper trail of ancestors that isn't in the public domain, but it would go pretty far back. It would it would be to a connection that would be many many generations back, right. more than likely. Um, and then uh, CM data, uh, Centimorgan data across segments has been showing the closeness of for ancestors centuries ago and ties lineages across families. This helps discover older ancestors. <laughs> That older ancestors as well as migration patterns. And then Paul, Patricia's questions are generally um, about centimorgans. Um, what does it mean in relation to SNPs? Um, what's the relation between a SNP and a centimorgan? And uh, I believe like if we haven't addressed all your questions, Patricia, definitely once again, email us all. And in uh, general, the, the analysis of SNPs is 21st century mm -hmm. and the analysis of um, Santa Morgan's is 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, and now there are ways to kind of connect some dots, but they're not an easy and obvious connection to each other. Right, right. So it's like old fashioned chromosome mapping is what the Santa Morgan's is referring to. And SNPs is the most contemporary type of analysis um, that we have, you know, uh, available to us. So they're, they're really very different from each other. Got it. Okay. Well, um, I want to thank everybody for all the questions. And, and as Monique has here, thank you for your incredible knowledge and generosity. Oh, my pleasure. I second, third, and fourth that, no question. Um, I, you've given us so much information. You've been so generous in answering all these questions to expand upon what you've already given us. Um, thank you guys. And thank you for arranging this, Heather and Michelle. We're so thankful that like we could um, host this for y'all. And please everyone, you know, if you have ideas for future lectures that you would like to see, please get in touch with us. Um, we're always looking for new topics and new, um, professionals to present on different topics. So please let us know what you want to see and we'll try our best to accommodate those requests. And um, please get in touch if you have any questions about the cemeteries. I'm always happy to help, like I said before. And then I'm gonna announce our April lecture soon, which will be on April 7th. Um, and it'll focus a lot on researching enslaved individuals within New Orleans um, historical records. Um, yes, and, and, and for everybody, this has all been recorded, including the Q&A session. Um, I'll probably have that up by Friday of next week on our YouTube channel, which I'm about to drop a link for. If you subscribe, you can, um, if you subscribe to the channel, you should be able to get 
uh, an update in your preferred method, whatever method you, per, you um, choose uh, when this video goes live. And I've just uh, linked our YouTube channel in the, in the chat. So uh, yeah, like and subscribe and uh, I will be posting it probably Friday next week. And um, again, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank Heather. you so much. Thank it was you. my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Incredible. Bye-bye. Okay. Y'all go enjoy your Saturday. All right. Bye. Thank you, everybody who came and asked questions and listened. Bye.